Hi there, and welcome to The Works. I'm Ben Peltier. And I'm Ben Che. In part two of this week's show, we look at Contemplating Landscape, the first Hong Kong solo exhibition of New York-based artist Janina Jap. Of German and Brazilian background, Jap likes to use different mediums to explore changeable landscapes and the properties. And in our studio, we'll have an a cappella performance from the Okai Singers, a group of friends from the aboriginal villages of Taiwan who got together over a decade ago and have been delighting audiences and winning praise ever since. First, though, the late German choreographer Pina Bausch enjoys considerable popularity in Hong Kong, mostly for the dance form she pioneered, which mixes choreography, drama, and feeling. During the Hong Kong Arts Festival, her company, the Tanz Theater Wuppertal, Pina Bausch, presented an earlier work that takes as its inspiration an 18th century German opera by Christoph Willibald Gluck. This piece was her first full-length production uh, in 1974. It's, in April, it's going to be 40 years old. And um, I think for in her um, development, she started with pure dance, also her early pieces. And, um, and then at a certain point, she realized that in order to express what she wanted, she needed to open up towards a general way of theater. In the Greek tragedy, Iphigenia in Taurus, Iphigenia is the high priestess of Diana in the temple of Taurus having been transported there magically by the goddess when her father, Agamemnon, attempted to offer her as a sacrifice. She has been ordered by King Toas to sacrifice her brother, Orestes, and his friend Pilades in her temple. The two have come to Taurus with the intention of stealing a statue of the goddess Diana. She doesn't know who they are. Orestes has also killed their mother, Clytemnestra, in retaliation for her role in their father, Agamemnon's murder. Pina Bausch's version of Gluck's opera version, Iphigenia in Taurus, was her second work with the Tanz Theater of Wuppertal she'd formed in 1973. It wasn't the only time she turned to Gluck for inspiration. In 1975, she based another dance on his Orpheus and Eurydice. I thought about the question why she chooses this uh, Gluck operas because normally, I mean, they even in Germany, Iphigenia of Taurus is almost never done in the theatres. And I think because Pina is as a choreographer at the same point than Gluck was when he wrote these operas to change the style uh, in a period where dance in the 70s of the last century and opera at Gluck's time was in a state where it was very virtuous, very technical, very with a loss of, um, of inner meanings and of real dramatic sense. So maybe that's why she has chosen these operas, because she all, all also was in this stadium of finding a new way to express herself. For the performances during the Hong Kong Arts Festival, as during its premiere in Wuppertal, the main singers and the choir were positioned among the audience on balconies. Conductor Jan Michael Horstman, who's worked with Pina since 1992, brought the main singers with him. He came for a site visit and audition in August last year. The chorus is mostly made up of members from the local choral group, De Concertisten. I mean, she doesn't tell the story word by word. As she goes more to the essence, to the feelings of the of the of the opera, like with the music. And uh, and for her, also in, in the other pieces, music was always a very important part. And uh, I think she had an incredible musicality and an incredible sense of the essence of music. So. Uh, and that's, of course, what you also feel in this, in this opera. 
During the dance, Orestes and his friend Pilades have two major pas de deux, one while lamenting their fate and impending deaths, and another when they're arguing which of them shall take the opportunity to be freed. Dominique Merci played Orestes when it first premiered in 1974. Now he's taking on an advisory role, having recently stepped down as artistic director, four years after Pina Bausch's death. Do you miss her? Of course. Of course. Yeah, many, all the time. I mean, we, we, keep, we keep going and she's there. She's very, there's, uh, her presence is very strong, I think. You know, as as strong as the absence somehow, and uh, but of course I do miss her. I felt like it was for me too much, too too heavy after a while, and and I decided to step down. And then we um, we asked Lutz first if if he would accept to take over, and that's what he did. Someday he'll come along. It was quite a surprise when Dominique Messi suddenly decided to not to continue. And um, I think it was only because it was the wish of the whole company that I do it, so that I started to think about it. I thought, you know, for me, um, Having been together with Pina uh, for 34 years, you know, but it was not only a working relationship, but also a personal relationship. And um, she gave me so much, and I thought perhaps it's the time to give something back. And so I said yes. Since last September, the company has been presenting a 40th anniversary program. Pina 40 includes talks, film screenings, exhibitions, concerts, and performances of Pina's new and old works. And we have this anniversary season, which is one of the hardest seasons the company ever had, because we have so many uh, pieces that we do that we haven't done for a long time, so, uh, and a lot of other activities, so that was a lot of work. And we are now in the process of uh, finding out how we are going to continue, which um, is going to be much more concrete in the next month. And um, the next year will be a transition period um, to prepare um, a beginning of change from the season 15, 16 on. It was very soon a, a very strange and strong demand. Would it be a new work? Or, or and uh, I think now it's it's um, it's going to be five years in July, in, in June that in June that uh, Pina passed away, and and we we do enter <coughs> more concretely, I think, in a transition period, and uh, it, it's very difficult to to. Um, to talk about really because it's still something very uh, fragile somehow even though five years without without the, the, the main person from the company be able to, to, to hold the company that way I think it's 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 a sort of um, it's quite exceptional I think I think that's the only chance I have to find my own way with my knowledge but not trying to imitate Pina or to sit there and think what would she have done. I don't know what she would she have done because she was full of surprises and uh, even though sometimes you could predict something or you thought you could predict and then you suddenly had she came up with something completely different. So. Uh, um, so I only can say I know there is something from her in me, but uh, I also know I have to go my own way. We'll be back after the break. See you then.
Welcome back. Jelana Jop was born in 1973 in Munich, Germany, and raised in Sao Paulo, Brazil. She studied at the University of Fine Arts in Hamburg before moving to New York, where she still lives and works. In her work, she likes to focus on landscapes, but she doesn't just paint them. She has previously mixed performance art, photography, and video work, as well as paintings and cutouts. Strips of paper on a gallery wall represent the tendrils of plants. Drips of paint show the natural process of blossoming, bloom, and decay. Some of her landscape works also include elements of the fantastic or even explorations of mythology. You can see her work at the Edward Maling Gallery until the 3rd of May. I do believe that, you know, Brazil and Germany is a big influence in my work. My family in Brazil is from the countryside, so we did spend vacations in a farm in the middle of the mountains with chickens, dogs, you know, the whole experience. And I think that was very vivid and present in me. And just that idea of, like, okay, if I want to cook something, I need to make a fire. I need, need to get wood and burn fire, and then I can make food. And I think that that is just very um, essential, and it's very um, important to have that relationship, to see where things come from. Where does the food come from? Where does the heat come from? Where, where does, you know, what about electricity, if we don't have electricity? And I think all this relationship is something that is very, um, you know, grounded in me, and I need to experience that. Through drawing, installation, photography, and video, New York-based artist Janaina Sharp explores the relationship and dialogue between landscape and the people who view it and live with it. In her current solo exhibition, Contemplating Landscape, she says she wants viewers to find the dialogue by themselves. With the objects, you know, they're placed in front of the canvas, and in a way the canvas does suggest a horizon, so what's the relationship between those objects? They're in a way almost looking at the horizon, and what's the space in between them? What's the relationship? So I'm trying to break one thing with the other thing and create that dynamic. That happens in the cutouts the same way, you know, like I, I cut out a shape that is basically the same shape. There's five pieces of paper here combined that are all cut in the same shape. And by unfolding them and sort of playing with the composition, I'm breaking those shapes and I'm making them, you know, like I'm combining all of them and creating a new one. As you see in this show, there is a video, there is um, drawings, there's painting, there is now a sculpture. Um, but for me, it's in a way all the same work. It deals with the same ideas. I do tend always to take some work with me, but I always travel with a camera, some props, and balloons are easy to take, you know. So I took those balloons with me and went to the beach and inflated them. Basically what I did was just like to take those balloons in a way the same idea of like taking a form that was like a rigid form, a circle, and insert that into a horizon, insert that into nature, into a landscape and see what happens. And because of the wind and the water, they started bouncing around and moving around and, and see how the balloons would navigate inside that landscape. For me, the whole magic of the work lies in the process. Like I could never um, think of a piece where I would have the answer before I start. And I think exposing things to nature, somehow you're exposing it to something that you don't know what's going to happen because it could rain, it could be windy, like the ball could be washed away and disappear. So there is like a hundred different options that I don't know and that drives me to, to do and to play around.
On Friday night at the Grand Hall of the University of Hong Kong, two young a cappella groups, Okai from Taiwan and the 24 from the University of York, will be sharing the stage. Since getting together just over a decade ago, Okai has presented over 500 performances around the world and won 17 awards internationally, including the 2013 CASA's Best Jazz Album Award. They're right now in a studio talking to Ben. Well, this year marks a really special year for your group. It's the 10th year you've been together. And uh, what do you have planned for this special year? Yes, we are right now preparing for our 10th anniversary album. And we are also planning on our anniversary concert tour around Asian uh, area next year, hopefully. One area of specialization for your group is the idea that you're performing Aboriginal Taiwanese songs, but as an a cappella ensemble. Are you guys pretty much the first group to do that? Um, yes, uh, we can say that. Um, we are the first um, Aboriginal a cappella group in Taiwan. And why we are doing our Aboriginal songs, it's because we've got three members from the Adaya tribe, which is an Aboriginal tribe in Taiwan. It, um, so that's why we brought uh, many um, Aboriginal elements into our music. So, uh, so please let me introduce a little bit of our members. Uh, Sean, Sean and Jen and Anton, they are from the same family. So, yeah, brothers and brothers sisters. And sisters. Yes. Acapella seems uh, quite a popular format in Asia and around the world. Um, is, is it quite popular in Taiwan to put together groups like this? Um, right now, it, uh, it's getting more and more popular for young people to group uh, acapella groups like us. But um, for us, we are special because we, we sing a, a, a huge variety of styles of music. We sing jazz, original songs, and then some popular songs. So, um, yeah, I think... Um, <laughs> well, certainly, I think your, your popularity is uh, quite high here in Hong Kong. I understand the, the concert uh, is already completely filled out, all the, all the spaces. Um, you also have a very interesting project at Hong Kong University with a commissioned piece for the yes. group. Um, what can you tell me about that? Uh, we are going to sing and um, perform a newly commissioned work by Dr. Chen from the music department of uh, Hong Kong University. And it's so very honored that we are able to be uh, cooperating with the Shen uh, player and also the 24, uh, the choir from UK. And it's such a new challenge to us. Uh, and what, uh, what can you sing for us here in the studio? Oh, tonight we would like to bring a special piece. Uh, it's an Aboriginal song. It's called the Yearning Song. And in Aboriginal language, it's called Sin, Sin Dramat. And in this song, we would like to show the respect and our appreciation for our ancestors for what they have done for us. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. 